Well, on behalf of the Satellite Industry Association um, and the American Astronomical Society, I want to thank everyone for joining us today to talk about the recommendations from SATCON 1. Um, we have a wonderful panelist panel of astronomers um, as well as satellite industry experts to talk about the results of this report. And I will introduce them um, as we go through the agenda. So first up, um, we have the two co-chairs of SATCON 1 that are going to uh, give us a presentation on their recommendations. So first we have Jeff Hall, who is the director of Lowell Observatory in Flagstaff, Arizona, and he's the chair of AAAS's Committee on Light Pollution, Radio Interference, and Space Debris. Um, and we have Connie Walker, who is a scientist at the National Science Foundation's NOIR lab. Um, she's president of the International Astronomical Union's Commission on the Protection of Existing and Potential Observatory Sites, and chair of the International Astronomical Union's Executive Committee Working Group on Dark and Quiet Sky Protections. So Jeff and Connie, please take it away. Okay, thanks. Um, so I understand someone's going to share a presentation we've got. Yep, that's that's me. Okay, thanks, Joel. Can everybody see that? You're good, Jeff. I'm good. Is everybody else good? Can you can you yes. hear me? Yep. Okay, so we'll start uh, the webinar with Connie and me. We're going to take just about uh, 15 minutes to provide a, a very high level overview of the SATCON 1 report and uh, the results that came out of that workshop. Uh, so this was supported by the AAS with uh, Joel uh, and Kelsey doing uh, much of the heavy lifting from the AAS end. Um, as noted, Connie and I were the co-chairs for the workshop. And we'd also like to note the, uh, the chairs of the four working groups. I see Lori Allen is on the call from a Noir Lab, um, uh, Pat Seitzer, um, Tony Tyson, who's on the, the call, and Richard Green, I, th I think I saw them all. Um, so um, let's go to the next slide. So just as a, a, a quick recap of the timeline, this was a, a workshop held, of course, by Zoom uh, at the end of June, the very beginning of uh, July. Um, focused heavily on the, the impacts of satellite constellations on optical uh, uh, astronomy. Um, this was very astronomically focused. There are many stakeholders that could potentially be involved, but this was really an impetus from the astronomy community that came out of some conversations and a special session at the Honolulu AAS meeting, uh, which uh, Patricia and, and Jared Green from SpaceX attended, and that was a very nice chance to get to know them and start some of these conversations going. Um, we appreciated SpaceX's participation um, actively in the workshop. Um, there were attendees as there, uh, there as well from Amazon Kuiper. Um, we we uh, divided the work into four working groups, uh, one assigned to each of those chairs to study observation simulations, uh, mitigations, and then, and then some of the metrics. What are the quantities that we try to, to measure against as we're trying to mitigate impacts. This will then lead up to uh, the SATCON 2 workshop, which, which Connie and I are beginning to work on, on planning. It's, it's lurching into gear amid many other, many other fires burning. Um, and this will be much more policy focused, and we intend it to, to include not only a, a broader set of um, operators, but also um, a broader set of stakeholders in general, uh, since the, uh, obviously the policy arena connects to many constituencies beyond strictly astronomy. So next slide. Okay, so um, I, will, I will quickly mention the, the principal findings and then turn it over to, to Connie and we'll begin the discussion of some of the specific recommendations. Um, you know, we pointed out in the report pretty explicitly that this is, um, as we say there in the second paragraph, this is a big deal for astronomy. Um, these are, the satellites are, are very bright uh, relative to the, the faintest uh, things we can observe with modern research telescopes. Um, and so we certainly needed to point out in the interest of our community that this is a very big deal for us and that some programs could be significantly uh, adversely impacted. Um, at the same time, uh, as you'll see, we wanted to phrase the recommendations in the sense of, this is what 
industry can do. This is what astronomy can do. And here's what we can do um, collaboratively. You know, obviously this is an area where there is potentially some conflict because there's negative potential impact on a number of astronomical programs. But uh, truly we also see it as an opportunity for two uh, different industries to, to work together collaboratively and hopefully to develop some innovative solutions that, that are to the benefit of, of all of us. Um, and that's, that's uh, truly the philosophy and mindset with which we're approaching this. And to that, I really want to thank um, Patricia and Jared for, for all the effort that they put into making this uh, a very productive and collaborative um, uh, relationship so far. And we also appreciate the conversations we've had uh, with, with Amazon and OneWeb as well. And we look forward to those expanding and broadening to other operators too. So we really wanna make this uh, collaborative and constructive throughout. So to that, to that event, you know, perhaps not surprisingly, uh, the programs that stand to be most impacted are the ones with, with high ATON due, the wide field, very sensitive surveys such as Vera Rubin um, and you know, Tony and SpaceX have been working closely together there. Um, one of the, the principal findings is that lower constellations are better. And even though the lower satellites are a bit brighter, the reduced nighttime visibility of the constellation uh, more than, than outweighs the, uh, the, the change in brightness. Um, and then as noted, um, the other finding was to have discussions during SATCON 1 about sort of the categories of, of effort where mitigations might fall and to, um, to sort of summarize those, I'm going to turn it over to, to Connie. Yeah, so um, as, as Jeff pretty much mentioned, before the actual SATCON workshop took place, uh, we had four working groups working on the four different areas of observation, simulations, metrics, and, um, and, and uh, mitigations. And, um, and those, those, the outcome of that research uh, came up with basically six main points or findings on which all the groups basically agreed. And the first one is that uh, to launch fewer or idealistically, no LEO constellations. And this is the only option identified that can actually achieve a zero impact, but of course it's not a practical uh, um, option. So, but uh, to actually try to launch fewer and, and try to mm, mitigate the situation, come up with mitigation solutions so that the ones you do launch uh, have them implemented. And then deploy satellites at orbital altitudes no higher than 600 kilometers um, and darken satellites by lowering their albedo, shading reflected sunlight or some combination thereof. Control uh, each satellite's altitude and orbit so that it reflects less sunlight to the earth. And then avoid satellite trails with the use of accurate ephemer ephemerides. I can never say that word. Um, we know solutions can be found and found together with satellite operators. For instance, in speaking to number three, SpaceX came up with two solutions, StarkSat and VisorSat. And although they did not solve the problems of brightness entirely, they made excellent strides towards that goal uh, to be fainter than seventh magnitude or 10 times fainter on station. Okay, sorry. Um, uh, the organizing committee and the, and the working group members concluded that the best way to present the recommendations that they um, ultimately came up with was to categorize them in terms of the groups that would handle the mitigations. And so you'll see on the next few slides that we have uh, them in three categories, uh, those for observatories and those for uh, satellite operators, and then for both observatories and satellite operators. Okay, on the, the observatory side, um, it's, it's clear we need to make strides in the software tools available for trail masking and removal, uh, such as you see in, in this image um, where there's uh, one bright trail that will simply have to be masked, but the, the goal of the visor sats is to, to have the, uh, the subsidiary trails to the point where they can be removed. Um, that is a, a very non-trivial um, problem since you often have multiple different people perhaps uh, reducing this enormous uh, database that will come out of the, the VRO science programs. Um, so so we, we, we need to improve the, the tools that we have available to do that. Um, more robust predictive tools for transits. Uh, you know, it's at, at a certain threshold, it becomes impossible 
uh, to dodge, but the better we understand uh, the timing and the more accurately we understand that, the better we can do at um, various strategies such as dodging or mid-exposure shuttering for facilities where that is viable uh, and so forth. And then finally, understanding um, you know, what are the systematics of the, the, the techniques you choose to mask out trails. There are very uh, subtle effects that could be uh, pervasive and, and insidious, and we need to understand that somewhat better. Um, Connie. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so for Constellation operators, we have four recommendations, two of which I will mention here. Recommendation number four, um, since in most instances, uh, we're not uh, lucky enough to have an NDA or non-disclosure agreement signed. So those outside of the satellite company cannot necessarily know what specific parameters are needed to do laboratory bi-directional reflectance distribution function testing. Uh, so we ask that the LEO operators perform the, their um, BRDF measurements as part of their satellite design in all cases, if possible, and, and their development phase and share the results with us. And uh, the BDRF or BRDF, excuse me, uh, testing would be particularly effective when paired with the uh, reflectance simulation analysis. So you can uh, compare the testing with the actual measurements. And then recommendation number five, we ask that LEO set um, operators design their satellites so that reflective sunlight would be slowly varying with the orbital phase. And this is especially true for high a do large aperture ground-based telescopes like the Rubin Observatory. Uh, and the aim is to have um, the brightness of the satellites fainter than uh, seventh magnitude at about 550 kilometers, which is equivalent to 44 watts per stridian, also at 550 kilometers. And the R orbit there, uh, just please note that it should be the uh, distance above the Earth's surface. Um, high Aitendu is, if, well, I'm sure you know what High Aitendu is. You can ask me later if you don't know. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Um, additionally, um, other things, the, the other two recommendations for operators. Um, any efforts that can be made to minimize a specular reflection as well as diffuse in the direction of observatories would be certainly helpful uh, to the extent that, that flaring events might occur. Uh, accurate timing guidance, again, perhaps combined with the observatory's efforts to, to develop better predictive tools would be extremely useful. Um, uh, Post-launch, uh, as, as we're in orbit rays and parking orbits, uh, to clump satellites to the greatest uh, degree practical, you know, a, a a small group of satellites in a localized patch of sky is better than, than distributed. This is the, the famous image here from, from Lowell that shows a, a very tightly, the very tightly clumped initial tranche of Starlink satellites. Um, and also something that I, I know SpaceX has been ex experimenting with is, is using attitude adjustment to, to minimize uh, reflecting surface area. I've, I've personally uh, observed some transits of, of, of that and it, uh, it does make a difference. Uh, they, they're actually quite hard to see when, when they're attitude adjusted like that. And uh, a corollary to that one is also to, to orbit rays and, and deorbit as rapidly as possible to minimize this phase where the satellites are somewhat um, brighter. And then we get to uh, the collaborative recommendations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so for observatories and operators, in collaboration, we have the following recommendations support a coordinated effort for optical observations of LEOSAT constellation satellites to characterize varying reflectivity and the effectiveness of experimental mitigations. And such observations require facilities spread over um, latitude and longitude to capture the sun angle dependent factors. In the longer term, we would like to support a comprehensive satellite constellation observing network with uniform observing and data reduction protocols for feedback to both operators and astronomical observatories. Next slide. Next slide. Oh, no, no, actually not next slide. I have two more recommendations. Oh, pardon okay. me. <laughs> uh, recommendation number nine uh, is to determine the cadence of, and quality of updated uh, positional information or process telemetry distribution predictive modeling required to achieve substantial improvement by about a factor of 10. Uh, at least uh, in, in publicly available positional information. And the last uh, recommendation there is to adopt a new standard format for publicly available ephemerides 
beyond the two line elements in order to include covariances and other useful information. And this um, recommendation basically goes hand in hand with the um, application noted in, in recommendation two and should be compatible with this format and include the appropriate errors. Next slide. Right, so to, to wrap up this, this opening part of the webinar, um, Connie and I just have a couple of concluding thoughts and then we'll turn it over for some comments from, from operators. Um, so we're all fairly new to this game. Um, you know, I know that uh, work in the radio has been ongoing for a while, but, but everybody sort of got their eyebrows brows raised last May with the first uh, Starlink launch. And, you know, I can tell you it was within a matter of, uh, I don't know, a week or two, we were in touch with Patricia because, I mean, I think SpaceX was equally surprised and everybody got in touch with everybody and some good conversations began more or less immediately. So that was, that was, that was great to see. Um, second bullet is important. You know, um, you know, we totally agree. And, and we tried to get this language into the initial press releases and statements from the AAS and the IAU that, that we acknowledge that there are multiple uses of space and that there are, are worthwhile things and that the, the vision uh, of the operators, for instance, to bring broadband connectivity to underserved populations is a worthy one. And, and we want to collaborate to, to mitigate the, the impacts on astronomy. Um, and, and as I said at the start, you know, we hope that, that the result is, is innovation and, and cool new ideas, which are beneficial to any who come up with them. Um, one thing uh, you need to understand is, is you know, decision making in academia, and as we move things forward, that often proceeds at the pace of a runaway Wagner opera. And so, um, uh, perhaps sometimes we will seem a, a little less nimble, perhaps, than our, our colleagues in the industry. And so, uh, bear with us on that one as we try to to, to move ahead. Um, Connie. Yeah. So um, next, yeah. This is uh, so at this time, there's not necessarily a sort of one-stop shopping for, um, for industry and, and the uh, astronomical community as uh, they develop and, and refine systems, but we're working on it. And in the interim, um, the professional societies, IAU, the AAS, RAS, it's the Royal Astronomical Society, and the European Astronomical Society um, have stepped into the void as much as they can, uh, and as well as major observatories like Noir Lab. Um, and in the US, the primary mechanism for significant new programs uh, like the instrumentation research and development and monitoring observatory networks um, at the uh, National Science Foundation comes from the uh, National Academies uh, the Decadal Survey. And the next one is focused for, uh, is a report due um, in uh, summer of 2021. So we hope that uh, the SATCON 1 and the SATCON 2 workshops, along with uh, another um, um, effort ca uh, called the Dark and Quiet Skies Workshop and conference that's gonna be coming up in April, uh, will, be, uh, will help get things started, at least from the um, astronomy community point of view. And we're very, very much um, wanting to work with industry on this because literally that's the only way we can come up with mutual um, mitigation solutions. Um, and so if you go to our last slide here, um, we really um, have an active participation now with SpaceX, as we said, and uh, Amazon Kuiper in our working groups and soon OneWeb uh, is gonna join us in our working groups for SATCON 2. So we're, we're really hoping that uh, other um, companies uh, in the SIA might be interested in joining us in that capacity, or at least uh, joining us for our SACCON2 meeting. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks so much, Connie and Jeff. Uh, that was a very helpful presentation for the satellite community. I realized I forgot to properly introduce myself for those who don't know me on the call. Therese Jones, Senior Director of Policy, Satellite Industry Association. Uh, used to be an astronomer, so it's really exciting for me to help facilitate this dialogue between astronomers um, and industry. And now we have three um, speakers from industry who are going to give you a bit of background um, on the industry perspective on satellites and astronomy. So we've got Patricia Cooper, who is Vice President of Satellite Government Affairs at SpaceX. We've got uh, Maurizio Venati, who is Senior Director for Technology, Strategy, and Partnerships at OneWeb. And we have Julie Zoller, Head of Global Regulatory Affairs at Project Kuiper. So Patricia, I'll let you take it away. Thanks so much, Therese. This uh, is a great forum and a real um, heartening conversation to see happen. 
Um, it strikes me as we come to the end of October that it was four years ago that 11 companies applied to the FCC for constellations in KUKA band. That was about 8,000 satellites. Two years later, there was a processing round for V-band that totaled about 15,000 satellites. And the most recent FCC processing round for KUK was for constellations totaling over 75,000 satellites. This doesn't include constellation projects in different frequency bands for different purposes like imagery or weather or tracking and those that don't serve the US. Um, and it also, also doesn't include government projects. So clearly the satellite constellation approach is something that is going to be um, an element of space going forward. And many of those constellations won't actually fly, but we need to continue and build on this kind of exchange between our satellite community and the, the sort of foreign land of astronomy on the other side of the space world. They have distinct nomenclatures, norms, assumptions, and goals. Um, we, 18 months ago, when SpaceX launched our first Starlink satellites, um, caught the attention of astronomers, certainly, and prompted a very deep exploration and engagement that I think the SATCOM 1 report represents. Um, I need to give a lot of credit for the astronomers who were able to put aside their, you know, many of their anxieties and concerns and really dig in um, at an extraordinary uh, level of expertise and seriousness, you know, really leading astronomers, including these here on, on today's uh, session to help us understand how we were affecting um, various kinds of ast astronomical observations and telescopes. Um, they've certainly helped us uh, devise some of the first mitigation ideas that are represented here. Um, it's not a surprise that Starlink um, meets many of these recommendations because I think it was our early first instance that uh, came up with uh, some of the first mitigations. We're hoping that others will come along with additional bright ideas as well. Maybe bright's the wrong word. Um, we certainly have benefited from being the first because we had the time and expertise of this community, um, but we also had the benefit of being um, a fairly iterative company that could build on what we learned and, uh, and set out uh, some changes even while we were deploying our satellite constellation. For us, in addition to the recommendations that we obviously have had a hand in, in exploring and, and developing with this astronomical community, we set out two goals. One of them was to reduce brightness, to reduce the impact on telescopes. Those are the two experiments that Jeff and Connie referenced. Dark sat to darken the spacecraft themselves and visor sats to shield them from the sun. We've now included uh, beyond those first two experiments that we fielded in January and June respectively, have now included visor set sunshades on every satellites launched, every one of our Starlink satellites launched since August. We now have over 890 satellites that we've deployed. Um, so that represents about 350 satellites, more than that, that have visor sets on them. Our second goal was to make the satellites invisible to the naked eye within a week from launch. And that was the operational role that Jeff referenced, trying post-launch to angle the spacecraft during orbit raising and parking so that they aren't as visible uh, in the dark sky to the unaided eye. Um, even though the measurements of these globally have been a little bit hampered by COVID, which closed a lot of telescopes, um, we've appreciated the collaboration with many observatories uh, and added some of our own to confirm that these have real promise as mitigation approaches. And um, I think the approach of a comprehensive satellite observing network is a good one. So the astronomy community is really mobilized to assess how we intersect and quantify how the satellites that are proposed affect them. Um, but there's more for the satellite community to do. I wanted to encourage you to read the SATCOM report. Uh, and also there's a, a dark and quiet skies paper that uh, Connie mentioned the International Astronomical Union and NOR Labs have uh, sponsored that. This is, uh, we need to make sure that the satellite community also is, is digging into these, these questions. Um, some of the work that we're doing already, um, enhancing the position and tracking data for satellites that we're doing already for situational awareness um, will help astronomers or many of them. Um, and for those small satellites or constellations, uh, uh, they'll still need to engage with astronomers to assess how they will affect that community. And I think we'll need to find a maybe more efficient way to do that on both sides. These recommendations envision some ways to make that kind of analysis and collaboration um, uh, a little more streamlined than our first mover engagement. Um, 
I think we'll also need to start looking at how to simulate and test novel spacecraft designs and how bright they are prior to launching the first demonstration satellites. We were able to iterate the design uh, twice midstream. That isn't always feasible. So we wanna make sure that that aspect is something that satellite um, operators and manufacturers take into account. These discussions are super important as astronomers and the commercial space sectors kind of converge in our shared space environment. With the scientific discoveries that astronomers are coming up with every day and the broadband connectivity that is uh, more critical than ever nowadays, both of our missions are important and I am confident that we will find a way to coexist. Thank you. Thanks so much, Patricia. Um, and up next we have Maurizio with OneWeb. Maurizio, I believe you're muted. Can you hear me now? Yep, perfect. Yeah, it didn't work, apologies. So good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, thank you, Therese. Um, as you know, uh, the last six months for OneWeb, you know, have been uh, rather, rather interesting. So the bankruptcy found us really at uh, our lowest uh, ebb, and uh, we had to fight for our own lives over the last six months. But uh, the outcome is uh, has been extremely, extremely positive. One of the aspects of the last six months is that um, we haven't been able to engage and contribute to these kind of discussions. Uh, and research with uh, the optical astronomy community as much as we wanted, as we hoped. Um, so responsible space has always been uh, uh, at our heart and uh, uh, our drive to deliver um, global connectivity has always been balanced with uh, uh, the, the, the care for space as, um, as, as our common resource and also has been one of the uh, foundations of the foundations for one web responsible space program that uh, we started uh, years ago. So now we are set to, to, to uh, re-emerge from, uh, from chapter 11, from bankruptcy, and uh, we're about to resume launches. So the next launch for our batch three is uh, scheduled mid December. And that will be followed by another 15 launches that uh, we'll see the constellation fully deployed by 2022. So our constellation is, um, is trying to strike a balance between altitude, so the lower and the fewer. So the altitude and the number of satellites that, uh, that we will deploy. Uh, we will need 588 satellites as a minimum, plus the spares to provide uh, global connectivity uh, 24, 24 seven. And uh, we try to strike you know, the, the right balance. Um, also, it's extremely interesting now to, uh, to, 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 to hear you know, the findings of the community. Um, and as, uh, as Jeff said, you know, we're all fairly new to this game, which uh, is the definition that uh, I very much you know, uh, resonate, resonate with. So since we, um, we, we, we re-emerged, we also stepped up um, uh, and uh, already um, taken a, a few steps uh, in order to, to become more active, proactive and forthcoming to these kind of, of conversations. First of all, uh, we are very thankful to, to and delighted to, to have been invited to the, the follow-up SATCOM2 activity and the working groups. Uh, and uh, um, you have our commitment that from now on, was, you know, we will be fully engaged and fully present in this in these kind of conversations. Another element that uh, from the recommendation resonated extremely well with uh, what uh, we are already planning to do internally is the request of the astronomy community uh, to distribute accurate TLEs information. And um, we're about to set up these uh, and control this in, in a centralized way. Um, an aspect related to the TLEs uh, uh, that is also is worth uh, um, stressing is that uh, the advantage of flying at 1200 kilometers uh, um, yields to trajectories that are inherently extremely stable and, uh, and predictable, so which uh, extends naturally the, uh, the validity, if you want, of the, of the TLEs. And third point is that we also started uh, observing uh, our own satellites through a, a, a series of observation campaigns that are targeting to um, uh, measure the, uh, the signature of, uh, of our satellites uh, on station at 1200 kilometers and uh, also you know, throughout the, the, the orbit race. An important point 
that was made uh, in uh, in the report was related to uh, the number of satellites and the and the recent uh, um, application for 48 roughly 48,000 satellites that was made by by OneWeb in in May. Um, two two points on on that. First of all, uh, that number um, was also a number that was uh, trying to give to the prospective investor, you know, as many options uh, as possible. Um, and we are already in the process of uh, reviewing these plans with uh, with the new with the new shareholders. I also would like to remember everyone that when OneWeb was uh, was incorporated, you know, the first design was targeting about two thousand satellites. Then we had another iteration. Uh, that um, uh, was considering infrastructure, space infrastructure for about 800 satellites. Uh, and then the number required to deliver the service came down to 588 plus the spares is about 650. So we believe that there are two uh, important ways for um, uh, moving forward with the analysis. For sure, there is a worst case scenario that uh, is important to be considered. Um, for the uh, astronomy community, but is also we believe it's also important to measure the impact based on the current industrial plans. So um, the assessment uh, of the current satellite design and the initial constellation configuration. So we believe that uh, um, while the worst case scenario is absolutely important and perfectly valid, there's also another scenario that uh, would be um, as important to be uh, understood and, uh, and analyzed. Um, and then we will have together, because uh, this is a new engagement that we, we are starting now, to, um, we have time to um, uh, benefit for this iteration and uh, a more coordinated assessment uh, uh, of the impact on the, of, of such large number of, um, of constellations. So, um, Closing, you know, I do appreciate the the patience. Uh, we, as one web, appreciate the patience of you know the the astronomy community that you had with us over the last six months. Uh, we started uh, re-engaging with, um, with with many of you, and thank you for uh, um, making us you know feel welcome as uh, as part of the discussion. And um, one other element that uh, I, I hope we, is going to trigger further further comments and questions is that. Uh, as part of these uh, um, uh, iterations uh, and discussions, it is important to involve as key stakeholder the manufacturing industry. Uh, they are one fundamental player in this game. For some of us, the, um, uh, the boundaries are more blurred, uh, especially you know, for, uh, uh, for, for the, for the uh, large constellation manufacturers but it's important to involve manufacturing industry in these, in these kind of discussions. And I welcome the questions you know, uh, in, the, in the second half of the hour. Thank you very much, Therese. Thank you so much, Maurizio. And next up, we have Julie Zoller from Project Kuiper. Thank you so much, Therese, and, and thank you for the opportunity to participate in the joint work of the astronomy community and industry. I believe we're all gaining a better understanding of reflectivity and what we can do working together. The SATCOM 1 report is a good start at documenting the Did I lose you? You're back now, Julie. We lost you for a second. Okay. Yeah. Not sure what happened. <laughs> As was noted in, in Connie and Jeff's presentation, the report places the recommendations into three categories. Recommendations for observatories, recommendations for constellation operators, and recommendations for collaboration. I think there's another way to look at the findings. Recommendations that decrease reflectivity through improved knowledge and coordination and recommendations that decrease reflectivity as a result of changes in system design or operations. Knowledge-based findings include improvements in simulations and reflectivity event prediction 
the ability to mask satellite trails, and higher fidelity of Femeridis information. With the right level of commitment, these recommendations could be implemented in the near term and would have long lasting benefits regardless of the constellations that come along in the future. Design-based recommendations include reducing the number and scale of LEO constellations, darkening satellites, and operating at certain attitudes. These recommendations have broader implications for things like mission operations and space safety, and should be examined carefully to avoid unwanted adverse effects. For example, as Connie and Jeff noted, the recommendation that satellites be flown at lower altitudes improves reflectivity, but requires more satellites be deployed to provide the same coverage, which has the opposite effect. By looking at recommendations through this lens, we can better assess the short-term and long-term impacts of each measure as we consider next steps. Reflectivity is a key consideration for Project Kuiper, and it's encouraging to see that many of the recommendations outlined so far are consistent with design and operational decisions we've made to date. This is an important issue and we look forward to working together to learn more about how we can be part of the solution. Thank you. Thanks so much, Julie. Um, and now we'll move on to the Q&A part of our session and we're joined by a few additional panelists. Um, so we've got Lori Allen, the Director of Mid-Scale Observatories at the National Science Foundation's NOIR Lab and Chair of the Observations Working Group for SATCON 1. Tony Tyson, Distinguished Professor of Physics at UC Davis, Chief Scientist at the, the Rubin Observatory, and the Chair of the Mitigations Working Group for SATCOM-1. Um, Pat Seltzer, Seltzer, who is a Research Professor Emeritus at, of Astronomy at the University of Michigan, and Chair of the Simulations Working Group for SATCOM-1. Richard Green, Assistant Director for Government Relations at the University of Arizona Seward Observatory and former Director of the Astronomy Division at NSF and Chair of the Metrics Working Group for SATCOM-1. Patrick McCarthy, Director of NSF's NOIR Lab. Joel Perriott, Deputy Executive Officer and Director of Public Policy at the American Astronomical Society a member of the Scientific Organizing Committee for SATCOM-1. And finally, Chris Hoffer from Amazon's Kuiper's um, international team lead um, for regulatory affairs. And I believe uh, Connie and Jeff, uh, did you have some questions for the satellite operators before we move on to the broader questions? Sure. Um, <clears throat> I'd like actually Tony, because uh, he's a very good person to, um, to explain this. Uh, talk about why we are really emphasizing lower altitudes versus, you know, something twice uh, the altitude. Um, and, and, you know, knowing that it does employ more satellites. And I was wondering if Tony could give uh, his two cents on that. Okay, hi, here's my two cents. Uh, I actually, uh, Pat Seitzer can address this issue as well. So um, the reason why the satellites need to be low primarily is because they're shielded by the earth from the sun for much of the night. We have to observe during the night. And so they're in shadow uh, where uh, during uh, much of our uh, observing with these huge next generation ground-based telescopes uh, that are coming online in the next few years. Uh, if you move up to uh, 1200 kilometers, for example, or much higher than 600, then uh, they can be seen all night, and particularly in the summer season uh, at the observatory. Uh, this means that uh, there's no place to hide, as it were, in terms of time. And some projects are uh, really severely impacted by that fact that there's no dark sky ever. Uh, and so that's the main reason uh, why these altitudes are, are um, are uh, important. Uh, there's also something that's sort of counterintuitive, and that is the next generation big telescopes are, well, big, and they have uh, large mirrors, and they're focused at infinity because that's where the rest of the universe is. And so satellites that are at higher altitudes, like 1200, are more in focus, unfortunately, 
and their surface brightness, the number of electrons per pixel, is higher. So that's a counterintuitive fact uh, that makes it difficult. And then, uh, Pat, uh, you may want to comment on this, but I mean, deorbiting these satellites is an extremely important issue. And I don't, you know, the, the lifetime at 1200 is, is centuries. That was more okay. than two cents. It's about three cents. Yeah, so I would second everything that, that Tony said. Um, in particular, there are objects like the Large Magellanic Cloud, which is the largest satellite galaxy of our own cloud of our own galaxy. It's a major area of new star formation, and there are astronomers that spend their entire career just studying that object. Um, and what you find is that if you were to fly fifty thousand satellites at twelve hundred kilometers, every thirty second exposure of that galaxy in the summertime would have a trail across it. Um, and that, that's, a, that, that's something that, that's very difficult uh, to accept. So, and the other thing I would say is that flying low also gains you in the space safety regime. Tony dealt on this, but uh, if you have a failure, the reentry times are, are much, much shorter. Um, but the primary reason for flying low is the fact that the Earth's shadow is a cone, it's not a cylinder, and thus we can have hours even in the summer uh, with no satellites visible if they're at say 600 kilometers or below. Thank you. Shall I ask another question? <laughs> yeah, go, go ahead, Connie. Okay, uh, this one's actually for industry. And I, I, um, I think it's important to note that SpaceX is a different kind of company than OneWeb or, or Kuiper, uh, Amazon Kuiper, um, in that they are all inclusive. So when they can make decisions to change their design, they don't need to necessarily, and Patricia, you can correct me if I'm wrong, go to another company, they can just do it within a couple of weeks time. Now we're dealing with other companies, thankfully, and we have to learn that their culture as well we have to learn what their parameters are in terms of what they can and cannot do and how long it might take. And if, you know, so I'm putting this question to both, um, <clears throat> to both uh, OneWeb and Amazon Kuiper uh, in terms of, uh, I heard you say, Maurizio, uh, about manufacturing, talking to the manufacturing industry. And if you can give us any further insight as to the um, pros and cons on that, that would be uh, illuminating. Thank you, thank you, Connie. Um, uh, for sure, you know, having uh, being fully vertically integrated and having you know full control of, uh, of the, the, the entire chain uh, back to back, you know, um, is uh, is to a certain extent an advantage. Regarding uh, you know our um, setup, as as you know, one web satellite is a joint venture between uh, one web and uh, Airbus, and uh, is the company that is responsible for the manufacturing of uh, of our satellites in in Florida. Um, but uh, what also is uh, is of the utmost importance is that this is a production line, and it's a production line of uh, allow me to say you know only six hundred. Plus, uh, plus satellites with an extremely tight uh, launch cadence. So we're talking about uh, the next 16 launches, you know, happening over the less than 24, 24 months from, from today. So changing uh, dramatically the, the design of such of an assembly line, because still, you know, we have to remind ourselves, we're not talking about uh, uh, an assembly line with numbers as large as mobile phones or cars. Uh, we're still, you know, talking about a few, a few hundreds. Um, is, uh, is extremely difficult if, if not impossible. What we want to do as part of uh, uh, the uh, assessment uh, of the, the satellite signature and measurement, measurement of the brightness of our satellites is, to identify if there are some quick wins that uh, we can, uh, well, after having been identified, you know, that can actually result in, uh, uh, in action that can reduce the brightness of the satellites. For sure, we can talk about uh, uh, changing the uh, uh, reflectivity characteristics of some of the surfaces. This is something that uh, is part of our plan. And also, um, 
let me say playing with the attitude of the satellites it's something that uh, we are actively actively considering so that that is for sure if you allow me to go back to um, uh, a couple of points that uh, were made uh, a few moments ago um, in particular regarding the the number of satellites the, the 48,000 um, I would like to stress once again that uh, these numbers are currently being reviewed and this is a very very important message that I would like to to deliver to to the audience today um, is an ongoing process uh, but it's something that uh, has also been triggered by the feedback that that we received from from the community thanks and Julie did you have anything you wanted to add Sure. Uh, last December, we announced we were building out our new headquarters in, in Redmond, Washington. Um, that is a facility where we're doing our design work and our pre-production manufacturing. So we are earlier in the process of development of our satellites than the previous speakers, but also have um, taken on board the recommendations that came from the SATCON 1 report and that are also coming from the dark and quiet skies report as we make those kinds of design decisions. Thanks. Thanks so much, Julie. Uh, and now I think we'd like to hear from the broader audience. Um, and I got two questions for the broader audience. So for the manufacturers, do you have ideas on how to predict and test the brightness of a spacecraft in the design stage? And for satellite operators, what information would you need as you're planning your system to incorporate these recommendations? Um, and raise your hand if you want to talk, but I'd like to call on Mark Skinner first um, from the Aerospace Corporation, for, both as a former astronomer, someone who works on SSA a lot, uh, and someone who comes from an FFRDC. Mark, go ahead. Thanks, Therese. Um, and thanks to my, my friends here on the panel. Uh, so yeah, as Therese mentioned, my background is astronomy. I'm a card-carrying member of the AAS. Uh, but I also consider myself an industrial astronomer. Um, and so previously I was a, an infra, uh, gamma ray and X-ray astronomer, but I've redshifted to the visible and the infrared. Um, and so I've got a number of remarks. Thanks for the wonderful presentations you have. Uh, but I must start off, it would be worth my head if I didn't mention this. When considering um, satellite coatings, uh, you need to consider the effects on infrared astronomy as well. Um, and uh, Ray Russell would, uh, would run me over with this car if I didn't mention that. Uh, that being said, uh, I think uh, the visor sat kind of thing and also changing attitude as satellites to avoid uh, reflective conditions is a very good way to go. That can even be um, programmed and doesn't require too much extra effort. Uh, some things that we're working on that might be of interest. So aerospace um, and I particularly have been in, involved in um, Observing satellites, I've been involved in observing satellites both on Maui um, and now at Aerospace Corporation for the last two decades. Behind me is uh, is the Aerotel one meter, which is a very modest telescope, but but for people that observe set satellites, that's actually a fairly big telescope. You can do a good job with even a 40 centimeter aperture, which I know was state of the art back in 1738. Um, what we're working now is to, to uh, incorporate uh, GPS coordinate fixes or tags from directly from satellite operators and passing that information along to the 18th Space Control Squadron, uh, which has a pressing need for this sort of thing. It, it allows much better um, uh, precision and, and accuracy of where satellites are. And we're trying to make this a, a industry standard best practice for all uh, LEO operators that are, are moving forward that have that capability. Uh, a little bit more difficult for GEO operators, of course, but maybe not quite as uh, necessary. Um, I, would in, I would suggest that you look at the things that PANSTARS and others have done as far as tools for removing some of the, um, uh, some of the satellite streaks. PANSTARS had this uh, big effort to do that. Um, they have a very large field of view. Uh, another a comment is I would also suggest uh, discussing this, bringing in um, people like PANSTARS, the NEO potentially has this asteroid crowd, uh, you know, planetary defense, as well as SSA folks. We observe satellites and, and a, a naked eye observable satellite is way too bright. We don't need it to be that bright, especially if you can use the GPS coordinates. Um, 
And to a comment on what I saw um, about uh, standards beyond the TLE, I believe the the CCSDS, the Consult Consultative Committee for Space Data Systems, um, and the um, International Organization for Standards do have existing uh, beyond TLE things that include covariance. So that may be uh, a solved problem that you, know, you can check off the list there. Um, I would suggest uh, that the committee look at, in, in a way, um, things that the Department of Commerce, which is going to be being handed the, uh, the baton, if you would, from the 18th to deal with the space traffic management uh, of civil and commercial and foreign entities that care to participate uh, going forward. They're, they're coming up with the, uh, here's a new acronym for everyone I'm guessing, the OADR, the Open Architecture Data Repository. Uh, that might be a very good source and a way to exchange information. And I believe the astronomer, astro astronomical community has a good way that it could act, interact with that through a known tool developed by astronomers, the International Virtual Observatory, which I have been trying to uh, be cheerleader for with the, with the Department of Commerce when they start doing bilateral, multilateral negotiations on SSA data sharing. So there's a lot going on. Um, I would uh, bring in people from NIST to talk about this and, and the Office of Space Commerce as well as the planetary defense folks, uh, NASA, uh, PanStars, and others that are doing that kind of thing. Um, I'm, I'm high, you know, I, I completely agree that, um, that when you observe things and you have a minimal terminator condition be, by dint of low altitude, that does help things. Although I noticed from my regulatory friends may say, well, the filings were for much higher. Um, so they're trying to do that. Uh, it's unfortunate that, um, that visible astronomy doesn't, and optical astronomy doesn't have some of the protections afforded to uh, the radio services through the ITU and things like that. But, but there we are. Uh, that's a topic for another discussion. So uh, a lot of good work here. Thanks for everyone's uh, attention. And I'll turn it back over to you. If there's any questions, I'm happy to answer anything. Bye-bye. Thanks so much, Mark, um, to provide that initial perspective. Um, I don't see any hands raised in the audience. P please feel free to raise your hands um, or comment in the chat if you'd like to speak. Uh, do any of our panelists have any sort of response to Mark's comments? Yeah, thanks, Mark. Uh, that's that's very nice. So I, I think we do have to consider the infrared, obviously. However, um, the sky is so bright in the infrared, depends upon what you mean by infrared, but generally speaking, brighter than about um, one and a half microns. The sky is so bright that the next generation big facilities are in space. Uh, Ground-based infrared astronomy um, is, uh, survey astronomy anyway, is gonna be quite limited. Uh, we did, uh, we have interacted strongly with PanStars and we have uh, currently uh, in the Rubin Observatory uh, state-of-the-art trail removal software, which uh, unfortunately, of course, fails uh, for the uh, objects that we're trying to look at, which are uh, about uh, 10 billion times fainter uh, than the satellites. So uh, that's asking too much of any algorithm. So we generally fail, even using state-of-the-art Huff algorithms in trail removal. And that's one of the big problems that's left over even after we get the satellites dimmed so that they don't cause detector problems. I don't think there's going to be any silver bullet. And so it's going to be a combination of, uh, of some sort of visor kind of thing to reduce reflections, some removal, as well as the reason I, I was harping on the GPS stuff is that it gives you much better ephemeris and uh, uncertainties to be able to uh, predict and know where the satellites actually are. I also uh, point out aerospace and my colleagues, I, I reviewed this paper several times, had a paper about six months ago on this, on this topic, and I've put the, uh, the link um, in the chat. Thank you. Thanks, I think GPS, you're right. That's gonna be critical. Yeah, and it helps out for the whole space traffic management problem anyway. Uh, so it's, it's, uh, it's, that's where we're going. Thanks so much. Um, and that sort of goes along with the question um, that we had. So for observatories to take steps to mitigate effects on astronomical observations, they need precise information about where the satellites are. Mark um, touched on this somewhat. Um, is this something you're willing to share for a satellite operator panelists or for anyone in the audience? Mm -hmm. 
Hi, Maurice here. One web. Uh, I can take this one uh, to start with. Uh, yes, for sure. Um, one of the things that uh, we highlight is that uh, we appreciate how important this information is, and uh, we want to be in the driving seat and become more forthcoming in in sharing these these type of information. So, um, sort of secondhand information can be found already, but I think it's important to have a centralized way to engage and to exchange these, these parameters uh, across the community. Um, and not only the, um, the scientific community, but also you know, uh, the, 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 um, all the, 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 the people that uh, you know, like to enjoy the sky uh, that are not you know, including the professional, professional community. That is for sure something that uh, we are planning to do and we started uh, putting a, um, uh, an activity in uh, at one web in place in order to be able to disseminate this information uh, uh, in a more central way. Thanks. Patricia, and, for, and for SpaceX's part, we already publish uh, our uh, locations and uh, covariance and predictive maneuvers, not only on spacetrack.org through the 18th SPCS, but also uh, partly in conversation with astronomers for their benefit, we share that same information on celestrack.org, which is a little more widely accessible uh, and appreciate the collaboration with TS Kelso on that. Trisha, Julie, did you have anything you wanted to add? Yes, we'll absolutely share that type of information. It's important for space safety as well as mitigating reflectivity. And we think it's important to share information from the pre-launch stage to the post-mission disposal stage. Thanks. Thanks so much. And I, I really like Mark's suggestion um, to work with the Office of Space Commerce, especially as they're putting together the Open Architecture Data Repository on this. So hopefully that's another mechanism for collaboration in the future. Um, I'm really excited that we've had such a wide variety of SIA member companies on the call. I know. Uh, some people are pretty new um, in terms of thinking about how to predict and test the brightness of spacecraft in the design stage and what sort of information you need as an operator, but I'm hopeful that we can continue this dialogue. Um, AAS, uh, Joel, Connie, Jeff, any final comments on your end as we wrap this up? Yeah, I know we don't have much time, but I guess I, I think one question we haven't quite gotten to yet was, and maybe we can do this after via email, um, but for the operators, as you are making plans and working to meet the recommendations of the SATCOM 1 report, you know, what, are, what information do you need from observatories, um, either immediately or ongoing, that will, that will help you uh, address some of these issues? And this is all too part of keeping this collaborative conversation going. Maybe we don't have time to delve into that now, but I wanted to get that question on the table and just say thanks to everybody for your time and engagement. And I would just like to add that if anyone would like to be involved uh, in our efforts, uh, our joint efforts, uh, please contact Jeff or I so that we can get you situated. Well, thanks so much, everyone. Thanks to um, all of our astronomer panelists as well as SIA panelists. Um, and I'm looking forward to continuing this dialogue as part of StatCon 2. Hopefully we can get more into what astronomer or what the satellite companies um, need from observatories, both within SIA and maybe as part of StatCon 2. So thanks everyone. And we'll send out the StatCon 2 information um, to all of you when we have it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks everybody Thank you. for Thank participating. Everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks so much.